Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am so glad you've joined me. My name is Lisa and I'm with Lisa Cape and Quilts and today we're going to sew together block number two of our mystery quilt called Dream, Hope and Love. This is a throw size mystery quilt and there are 12 blocks to this series and I cannot wait to reveal block number two. As we open up our binder, just a quick review of block number one. It was the Dresden plate. And let me just say how proud I am of so many of you. This is the first time that many of you have ever sewn together the Dresden plate. And looking at your pictures, I would never know that if you did not tell me. I am just as proud as I can be of all of you. It has been a lot of fun this past week looking at your pictures and talking to many of you. If you would like to share your picture of the Dresden plate block, I have a link to my Facebook page. Jump on over there. I have posted a picture of my finished block and in the comment section of that post you'll see many pictures of finished Dresden plates. I invite you to share your picture and look through all of the pictures. It is so much fun. Isn't that one of the great things about quilting? We can all take the same block and customize it with our favorite colors and patterns and each one of us make a unique quilting block to us. And so I really love that about quilting and I have just had so much fun this past week. Moving on to block number two. Look at how cute he is. I say he. It could be a she on your quilt. <laughs> this block is called Kitty Cat. It is going to finish at 14 and a half inches wide and 18 and a half inches long. Let's go ahead and take this out of the sleeve and we're going to very quickly go over the pattern for this quilt. Now, if you are mapping along with us, I have my two inch grid sheet here and uh, we've already placed block number one. Find your key cap block and cut him out just like that. And the placement for this guy is going to be very simple. After last week, I want to keep block number two as simple as possible. <laughs> cut him out and we are placing him right down in the lower corner just like this. And there you go. Now you can see I am skipping around. I want to keep the uh, reveal of the layout of this quilt a secret as long as possible. But as the weeks go by, we're going to start to fill in all of these empty blocks and the quilt will really come together and unify. So keeping the mystery, we are working down here today. So let's go ahead and take a look at this pattern. Getting started, of course we have our cover page for your binder. We have three detailed ways of doing applique, so pick your favorite way of doing applique. Today I'm going to be using Heat and Bond Light and doing a raw edge applique. Now, I do not want to be redundant in the videos and I'd really like to take each block and focus on one or two tips that will help you out in the sewing process of each block. So if you are extremely new to quilting and you've never worked with Heat & Bond Light, I'm going to post three of my previous videos in the description box where I give you a step-by-step -step, uh, walkthrough and tutorial on how to use Heat & Bond Light when doing raw edge applique. Of course, I invite you to use whatever method of applique for your blocks that is your favorite. Uh, I do hope that uh, you go beyond your comfort zone and try new techniques and so I will be showing in future videos uh, some other techniques as well that I haven't covered as much as the heat and bond light but I don't want to keep repeating myself and many of you have worked with that product and so you know how it works and I do give very uh, detailed written instructions as well so Today I'm going to focus on doing a satin stitch with your machine. Uh, I avoided the satin stitch for so long because I just was, 
was so frustrated with the results that I got and so I thought I would share some tips on how to do a satin stitch and we're also going to be doing some hand sewing today I'm going to show you how to do a back stitch when doing hand embroidery and I'm going to show you how I sew his whiskers of course you could use fabric markers as well or use your machine to stitch out his, his whiskers but I thought I would demonstrate how I do a back stitch. So those are the tips that I'm going to share with you today. We have, of course, after page two, there are three pages of templates for this pattern. You can see one page has the layout for the face and all of the small bits that make up the body of the cat. And then you have these two pages and I just want to show you in the instructions it says what to do but I want to make it very easy. Cut apart one of your pages. Your templates have a dotted line on both pieces. Cut on the dotted line and then tape them to your next page and it's going to look just like this. And there's your complete templates for piece number four and piece number six. Now this just easily folds in on itself and you can put this back into your binder and you really only have to do it one time. So, as far as the fabric requirements, you will need a background fabric cut to 14 and a half inches wide and 18 and a half inches long. You'll need some scraps uh, that are slightly larger than all of your template pieces. I'm using clothing. Uh, I have heard from several of you who are also using clothing and so if that's the case for you this week is super easy because you do not have to stabilize or add any interfacing to the back of your clothing if you're using a fusible like I am. The heat and bond when ironed to the back of your clothing really acts as a stabilizer on its own so that's one step that you get to skip this week. Now I've included some suggestions on uh, ways to finish the face. You could use yarn, embroidery thread, or fabric markers. Uh, some way to achieve his little whiskers, whatever way that you choose to embellish his face. I've also suggested using buttons for the eyes as I did. Uh, I'm making three of these quilts. I've already done two of my blocks and I'll show you uh, each one at the end of the video. Let's move on with the instructions. Of course, your first step would be to press and cut your background fabric and set that aside. Then you're going to tape together your two templates and then we are moving on to our applique pieces. Again, if you're new to using Heat and Bond Light, I really do suggest you check out those three other videos that I've linked down below. Uh, many of you have already used that product and so I'm not going to go through the steps of tracing and cutting out those pattern pieces. Then we're going to talk about applique placement. So this is where I'm going to stop and bring in the block where I am now and let's talk about the placement of our cat pieces. As we come back you can see that I already used the heat and bond light and cut out all of my pieces. I've already fused them to my background and I want to talk just a second about the placement of your pieces and layering. The cat's body I brought somewhere in the center of the block and I matched the raw edge of the body to the bottom of this block. Now keep in mind that this is at the bottom of our quilt and when we do our binding at the very end the binding will come up over the bottom of the cat and that's perfectly fine. It's also going to help secure the bottom part of this applique. Now let's talk a little bit about the layering. These two pieces fit right up underneath of the main part of the body and that's really important because when we do our secure stitches, uh, in this case I'm going to do a satin stitch, when we come along and satin stitch his body, we're also going to be securing the applique pieces that fit up underneath of his body. So the right and left legs, I've tucked just ever so slightly underneath the main part of the body. The head I made sure was underneath of his bandana 
And so when I stitch along through here, I'm securing both of those pieces. And the heart is really up to you on the placement. You can place it on top of the bandana and it also looks really cute below the bandana. So that's really a personal choice. Once you have all of your pieces in a place, that is when I would start fusing everything down. Just do a double check and make sure that everything is the way you want it to be before you ever bring your iron over. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to the part that I want to show you uh, in this video and that is doing the satin stitches. The satin stitch will really help uh, separate my pieces. You can see uh, before I stitch anything, there's really no definition. I mean, you can kind of see the individual pieces, but as we stitch this out, the pieces are really gonna separate and uh, give some definition to my cap. I think I am ready to go to the machine. We're gonna give you some tips on the satin stitch. My very first tip for doing a satin stitch successfully and more fun would be to always stabilize your work. There are many different types of stabilizer on the market and in your fabric and quilt shops. And uh, I also like to use phone book pages and more cost effective would be to use a coffee filter. Coffee filters uh, act as a very light tearaway stabilizer and is great for doing applique work when you want to remove the stabilizer from the backside of your block. Let's talk a second about why I was having issues when I first started quilting and I would attempt to do a satin stitch. Your machine when doing a satin stitch is placing those stitches very, very close together. And most of the time the fabrics that you're using cannot handle that amount of tension and pressure and it will cause your fabric to bunch up or skip stitches or uh, your stitches will be ununiform and not the same size and sometimes you'll get uh, thread jams on the underside or the top side of your work. I found it all so very frustrating and so I gave up on it for many, many years. And uh, thanks to YouTube, <laughs> uh, several years ago, I realized that you're supposed to stabilize your work. And believe me, it helps a lot. And I think you will find the results with your satin stitch much cleaner and the whole process a lot easier if you stabilize your work. What I've done with my cat before I bring it over to the machine is I just took three coffee filters, ironed them flat, and I took a uh, Elmer's washable school glue stick. I pasted my coffee filters over top of my work, making sure that they extend past everywhere you're gonna be sewing. Believe it or not, this is gonna help a lot when doing a satin stitch. This glue uh, does not prevent you from removing your uh, coffee filter when it's done and all the glue washes out of your quilt uh, at the end. So it's a perfect way to keep these filters in place as you're stitching along. The next thing that I wanna talk about when doing a satin stitch would be the settings on your machine and the foot that you use to do your satin stitch. Make sure that you are using the correct foot that came with your machine to do a satin stitch. A fast way to break a needle would be to have the wrong foot in your machine when you go to do a satin stitch. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> next, next, let's talk about the settings on your machine. Of course, uh, there are countless different brands and types of sewing machines. And so I really suggest if you've never done a satin stitch on your machine that you break out the manual and you read through the instructions because all of the settings from machine to machine are different. Some machines have a built-in satin stitch setting already programmed into your machine. My machine to achieve a satin stitch I have to bring it over to number three which is a zigzag stitch and then adjust my stitch width and my stitch length to achieve a satin stitch. What I highly recommend is that you take some fabric 
and you sit down with your machine and you start playing with the settings and uh, different lengths and widths until you achieve a very nice uniform satin stitch. I always say practice, practice, practice. Certainly uh, we are all at different levels of our sewing and uh, from earlier I told you I had many problems with the satin stitch and the only way that I've gotten certainly not an expert but I have gotten a lot better was to practice and so just spend some time with your machine see what your machine likes as far as the settings uh, I can guarantee you even if you have this same machine it probably likes different settings than mine does they all have their own attitudes when it comes to stitching and so just experiment with your settings and your tension do not be afraid to adjust your tension when doing a satin stitch each time you sew with different threads or different fabrics it's always going to require an adjustment with your tension because they're not all the same you're working with different uh, thread types and different fabric types and some of your fabrics might be thicker than others and some of your thread could be thicker or thinner so with each different project adjust your tension according to the materials that you're working with that's going to save a lot of headache <laughs> when you bring over your work and you start stitching the final satin stitches so practice play with the, the different settings and find out what your machine likes uh, it's much like a relationship I have worked with this machine for a few years now and I know what it likes I know the the threads that it likes to use and the fabrics that it, are are its favorites that it likes to use and how to manipulate all of the settings according to my machine so find your satin stitch or find out how to program your zigzag stitch and start practicing and always do a sample before you bring in your work. Next we're going to start talking about doing the actual stitching on our machine. I have my cat block here and uh, I want to talk for just a second about the stitch order of all of our pieces. Anytime you have an applique pattern and your pieces tuck up underneath of other pieces. Always start with those pieces first. As an example, when we stitch the right leg, I will start up here and go all around, up around the curly part of the tail and come back down and I will finish here, doing a back stitch both at the beginning and the end. As I stitch along, when I come to the body of the cat, when I'm sewing through here is going to complete this stitch and secure both pieces of my applique. So always keep in mind the order of what you are stitching and what uh, the layering process is of your work. That's going to give you a nice clean finish with your satin stitch. Next let's, let's talk about uh, where to start and stop with your needle when you turn your work. A lot of the times I was so frustrated because I would be working on a piece and notice when I was done or as I'm stitching along that I would have little V's or areas in my stitching when I turned my work that left some fabric without any stitches. <laughs> have you ever experienced that? That is because I did not stop in the right place when I shifted my work. So let's talk about this. Anytime you have a curve or a point, you want to pay attention to where you stop before you pivot, keeping in mind to always lower the needle into your work before you ever turn or shift your work. Here on the body of the cat, we have an outside curve. Anytime you have a curve that you are stitching and uh, you are turning your work to the right, make sure to stop in your background, not on the applique. When you stop on your background and shift, uh, you're going to eliminate any little gaps in your stitches. On the opposite end, anytime you are stitching and you have a curve,
that you are shifting your work to the left or a, an inward curve, make sure you stop with your needle in the applique itself and not on the background. That's going to give you nice even stitches all through your curves and your points and you won't have any little skipped places. <laughs> Knowing where to start and stop has really helped me get a nice and pretty finish with my satin stitch. And it does take some getting used to and trying to remember. So I say go very slowly when stitching. And just keep in mind which direction you are turning. And either start or, or stop in the background or in the applique. That's going to help a lot. So I think I'm going to go ahead and start stitching this out and uh, I will film, if not all of this, a good part of that so you can see for an example when I stop in the background and when I stop in the applique itself. I think that that might be helpful to show you. So let's get stitching. We're going to start the stitch out of the tail part of this applique, pardon my finger. I've sped this part of the video up three times faster so it doesn't take quite as long. As we are stitching we come to the first inward curve so I'm stopping with my needle in the applique itself before I turn my work. And we come to the easy part and it's pretty much straight sewing right down through and now we're going to come to the top of the tail and we have an outward curve so we are stopping in the background each time we stop we are making sure the needle is in the down position in the background anytime you have smaller curves it really does help to achieve a nice prettier look if you stop frequently and turn your work a lot, the, uh, the stitching will be uh, a lot smoother. And uh, larger curves, you don't really have to stop quite as much, but we have quite a tight little curve up here on the tail. Again, I'm still stopping in the background on an outward curve and just stitching right around. I have a very small throat space in my sewing machine, so I have everything tucked up underneath it there. Still working on an outward curve. All the way around the tip of the tail. And now we come back to an inward curve. And so now when we stop, we shift our fabric to the left. We are making sure our needle position is in the left or on the applique. Just take your time and go slowly, paying attention to your needle position as you go. And here's another small little tip. If you forgot and had your needle in the wrong position when you made the turn and you're sewing along and just notice that the stitches aren't right and you have a little gap, stop and do some back stitching right over top of the little gap and then continue on. <laughs> That's a quick way to fix it. If you realize it, you know, pretty quickly, you can repair it really fast and then continue on with your work. Now we're coming back to the other side of the straight part of the tail and that is very easy, just sewing along. The stabilizer helps so much. I do not have any puckering or skip stitches in any part of my sew out with the tail. And again, we come to our last outward curve and we are stopping on the background. Again, make sure you do a back stitch when you come to the end to finish off your stitch. And here we are. You can see my satin stitch goes all the way around and that nothing is puckering. I do have some wrinkles from manipulating all of my fabric, but we'll take care of that at the end. 
and uh, it looks fantastic. You can see the satin stitch really defines the shape that you are stitching. When we get to the cat's body, it's really going to define the different pieces of the cat. And so that's one of the reasons why I've always wanted to do the satin stitch. And I was very determined to figure it all out and find out ways to make it better. I hope that showing you the stitch out of the tail shows you the different places and explains that a lot easier. If you have questions, feel free to jump down to the comment section below and I will try to be as helpful as I can. I'm going to go ahead and finish out stitching the rest of my pieces and we will meet back when we talk about the placement of the cat's face. Here we are, all of my pieces have been stitched and you can see that the satin stitch really helps define and separate your pieces. So I think that looks amazing. <laughs> so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the face. Before we move on, let me talk about uh, three ways to achieve the face. You can use a fabric marker, which will look fabulous if you go that way. You can sew your face by your machine. If you're doing that, leave the stabilizer on your uh, quilt block while you're doing that. And if you are hand stitching, go ahead and remove the stabilizer now. I have my previous two blocks that I've done, and this is the hand stitching, and that's the back stitch I'm gonna show you today. Let's focus. So that's really cute. All of this is hand stitched all of his whiskers and of course buttons for his eyes. On this cat I did all of my stitching on my machine with uh, my free motion foot on my machine and so I left actually I did not leave the stabilizer on you can see a little bit of puckering there uh, so that's by machine leave your stabilizer on that'll help with all the little puckerings when we quilt this all of that will disappear so there's two different ways that uh, you can finish his face. I'm going to go ahead and do hand stitching and so I'm going to remove the stabilizer and it is just as easy as this. Tearing away any of your paper. Now because we use the glue stick you might have little bits of paper that stay on there like that. <laughs> but when you wash the quilt, that'll disappear. I'm gonna go ahead and remove all of my paper from my piece and get ready to trace on our face. I just finished removing all the stabilizer from the back side of my quilt block and I'm ready to move on to the face. Now because I used a light colored muslin, I can place my face part underneath of my block and pretty much see through the background enough to be able to trace the end pieces of the whiskers and that helps me a lot and gives me a reference point. If you have used a background fabric that you cannot see through very easily, they do make things uh, like hot iron transfer pencils and you can trace this cat and just transfer it right to the top of your block and give you the placement of everything. Or you can just hand draw uh, just by referencing the picture where you want your whiskers to go. So these are very helpful, although not my favorite thing to use. <laughs> Here I have a, uh, a marking pencil made by Dritz and it erases with heat. And so what I like to do is just place the cat's face underneath of everything and line it all up and I can just see through that muslin enough to line up where I want the whiskers to be and go ahead and just trace right onto my background the ends of these whiskers just like that and what's really nice about these markers is if you end up sewing off the line, it doesn't matter because if you hit this with your uh, iron, it erases all of the marks. So now we are just tracing 
what I can see, and that really just gives me a reference point of where the whiskers are going to go. And I can just pretty much eyeball how far in I want the whiskers to go. Just like that. And there are my whiskers. I'm going to take this out and just look at the picture and know that I want to have a stitch that runs down like that and then a triangle at the top and then I will sew on my buttons for the eyes right there. <laughs> so transferring the face can be as simple as that. I'm going to go ahead and hoop this and get my embroidery floss ready and I'm going to show you how to do a back stitch if you'd like to use that to fill in your whiskers. I have my cat all hooped up. I do not like placing embroidery hoops on my finished work like this. <laughs> For some reason it really bugs me because when you take the hoop off you have that little ring that you have to iron and get rid of. But we will get rid of the ring after we're done. I'm going to be really honest. I do not like hand stitching. I don't have the patience for it. And maybe because I don't do it often enough, my skill level is very, very low. <laughs> but I do love the look that it gives to my projects. And I think it's just very quaint and uh, just a special, special look. So today we're going to be using some embroidery, just DMC floss. You can separate the strands if you want a thinner stitch. I have it just the way that it comes and I have not separated any of my strands. I tied a knot at the end of my string and I have it in a needle that has an eye that's large enough to thread all six strands of floss through it. I do have some thread magic here. I'm just going to run my thread through that. Um, I've done it with and without doing this and I do notice a slight difference in the fact that my th thread when I'm stitching does not knot up as much when I use this. So if you have some of that, that would be helpful and we're ready to go ahead and start stitching. Because I don't do this a lot, I'm hoping that I can give pretty helpful advice here. <laughs> we'll see. All right, I'm starting from the back side of my block and I'm going to come up right at the beginning of this line here. So right there on the line and just pull my thread all the way through. Now the knot is touching the back of my fabric and I'm ready to take my first stitch. You of course can pick whatever stitch length you want to do. I will say that when you're doing curves, the smaller the stitch length, the uh, more curvy your line will be versus doing a longer stitch in these areas, it'll look kind of boxy. So shorten your stitch, stitch length when you get to the curves. We're just going to go in on that line and bring our thread to the back of the fabric pulling it so that it's not loose. And next, we're going to come up the same distance away as our stitch length. So now we're coming up back here, or up here, and let's come to the top. And the reason they call this a back stitch is now we're going to go travel backwards into the hole that we went previously. <laughs> I told you I don't do this a lot so I don't know the terminology. This uh, hole right here we're going to go right straight. You find it. There we go. Right back into that hole. And pull it tight. Now when we take our next stitch again we're going to come up just like that. Come up through to the top and then travel backwards and go back down through 
the whole of this stitch. And there we go. You can see I'm not exactly straight. <laughs> Again, we're going to come back up from the bottom. And then we're going to travel back and go through that hole. And you're pretty much just repeating this whole process all the way through. Just like that. I'm going to travel right over top of those satin stitching stitches. Trying to do this on camera is not the easiest <laughs> either, so I think it's turning out pretty well considering the circumstances. Again, we're going to travel up. And then go back. And go back and this is the process that I used to fill in all of the cat's uh, details on his face so I do think that you know I wouldn't mind sitting down in the evening while we watch TV to do some of this uh, because it is a little time con consuming and I do like working on projects in the evening when I'm just sitting. So maybe I will brush up on my different hand embroidery sewing skills. But, you know, I think that looks quirky and it looks cute. So I'm happy with it. <laughs> What's also really special is that, uh, you know, I, I've said before I'm using my Nana's clothes. To make this quilt, this was also her embroidery thread. So she had given me a, a few years ago her whole collection of DMC thread. She was an avid cross stitcher and she got to the point where her neck bothered her so much that she just couldn't do it anymore and when, when she got to that point she gave me all of her uh, threads. So I have a huge, huge collection of so many colors and I think it's really special that this is her thread in this quilt. So you can see through this curve I've made my stitches a lot shorter like that and we're going to take one more. and then finish up the whisker just like that. So there we are. <laughs> and that is a back stitch, or at least my explanation of doing an, a back stitch. I hope that that was not too confusing. When you're done, you can just flip this over and run your thread through a previous stitch and tie it a knot and trim off the extra thread. So you can see there are six whiskers that have to be done just like that and so I think I'll turn on some music and just sit back and relax I get much better results when um, I'm under less stress and I will sew in all of the details of his face and put his two eyes on with buttons you of course could use uh, fabric for his nose and his eyes if you would like so let me go do some hand stitching and we will be back to finish up this block. And here we are. That took me a, a pretty long minute. <laughs> but I finished all the hand stitching of the face and I added my two buttons. I do think my two buttons are slightly different, but he is so adorable. I love him. I think this block is super cute. 
and I would love to see your finished cat block. If you want to jump on over to Facebook, I'll have the link below. I'm going to post my finished cat block on my Facebook page and I invite you to join me there and post your pictures in the comment section below Mr. Cat here. I did want to make one little correction as I was doing some hand stitching on his face. I thought about my instructions and on the last page of the instructions where it says finishing touches, I talk about doing the hand stitching. I called it a whip stitch. That was not a whip stitch, that was a back stitch. I don't believe a whip stitch would work to achieve the whiskers. I might be wrong, I don't know all the terminology, but I certainly did a back stitch today. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think a, a whip stitch would work in that in that situation so if you have made your cat block and you loved every part of the process and now you're done and you want to make another I am going to post a, a mock-up of a quilt design using just this cat block you could add sashing and cornerstones a cute border around your quilt and make an adorable cat quilt you could use different colors different fabrics you could make the cats all the same. You could make them all different. You could make girl cats and boy cats. Uh, you could add things like bells or lace, uh, all different kinds of ways you can embellish your cats. Wouldn't that be such a cute quilt? So not only could you use this pattern for our mystery quilt, you can adapt it into all kinds of quilts. So I'm really hoping you get creative. And if you do, I would love to see your work. Uh, I think that is everything. So, oh, there's one more thing that I did want to show. On the pattern, I do not talk about adding a little line to define his two front legs. I really think that that's optional. I'm leaving this one without it. But let me show you if you decide that you wanted to do this stitch. It's just a satin stitch and you can make it any length and it just sort of defines his two front legs. It's very optional. It's like an embellishment if you want to do that. That's what I did. I think that is everything. Again, I can't wait to see your pictures. I wake up every morning excited wondering whose block I'm going to see today or who I'm going to hear from. There are several different ways you can contact me if you have questions. You can jump below and uh, ask me your questions in the comment section. Again, you can join me on Facebook. You can send me messages or post directly onto my Facebook. And if you don't have Facebook, uh, Facebook, you can join me on Etsy. And I believe you can send pictures through the message uh, on Etsy as well. All of those ways to contact me are in the description box below. This has been a lot of fun. I cannot wait to see you next Sunday when we cover block three. Until then, I hope you have lots of fun with Kitty Cat. We will see you later.